Happy Friday again, Nudge fans. It's that time again. It's Nudge Coach Happy Hour. My name is Phil Bean. I'm here with the one and only Mac underscore Gamble. Um, there's not a lot of news to report today. I don't have anything exciting to talk about up front. Other than I've now been called underscore in, I think, two different two different times in the wild over the past week. So That's that name seems to be catching on in a way that I don't think we anticipated. Go team. Keep it up. All your emails to the show. Mention Mac underscore gamble or just call him underscore. That's totally fine with me. Um, hey, random shout out. This just crossed my mind for some reason. Good friend William Cochran's birthday is today. Shout out Will Cochran. He's not going to listen to this, but what the hell? <laughs> That's true. Thank you for reminding me. I need to text him. That was exactly what went through my head. I need to give him a shout. Mm-hmm. All right. Everybody is excited to hear that, I'm sure. Um, interesting week, as always. We, we relearned an important lesson, I would say, this week that I think we should dig into a little bit because it's a lesson that I think all of you could relearn as well. And here's basically what it is. We relearned why we measure everything and what can happen when you make small adjustments to the right thing. Let's start with why we measure everything. This feels like an existential question. (laughs) <laughs> I think I think early on too, I'm a big believer in measure everything because if you don't, you don't notice when things don't work. <laughs> so you think about all the systems and processes you have in place, like email automations and lead capturing and all these little pieces that connect. And I find if you, especially early on, if you don't measure everything, there's a very good chance something's just not working and you have no idea about it. And yep you know, technology doesn't always work and that's just the nature of what it is. So I always recommend, we have a dashboard we look at every week. We look at the numbers and for the main point of just helping point out to us, Hey, is stuff working the way it should be? Or is it not? Do we need to think, do we need to look at this in more, more detail? I think Mac referred to this as the Oh shit dashboard right before we jumped on, um, which I didn't know we had branded it as such, but I think that's exceptional branding for it. I'm re I'm relabeling it today to that. (laughs) But it's, I think it's, it's really important early on, especially if you don't have a huge team that, cause you're probably relying on a handful of different systems that, especially if you're thinking about anything that's kind of client facing or prospect facing that they're interacting with. And there's, you know, there's, there's a handoff or they're kind of jumping across different systems, um, especially if it has to do with like your acquisition or how you're engaging your clients measure everything. Um, I could, you know, you said it before, you can't optimize what you don't measure. I think in important yeah. detail, but it, you can really unlock, you know, you can put yourself in a bad place if you don't measure it and it stops working. But to your point, super cool story of over the past six weeks, we've eight, eight weeks, we've been obsessing over something mm-hmm. and been countless meetings of addressing this one metric. And then I think this story of how we kind of optimized it was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. No, it wasn't. It definitely was not like a, a look at it once, look at the numbers once. Oh, we need to fix that problem solved. That was not what happened here. This is obsessing over the numbers, looking at them again every week, tinkering with things that we can, can rule out and then making a change mm-hmm. that had a major impact. Um, beyond that, you know, well, let, actually, let's. Why don't we just go ahead and go into that? The actual what we're talking about yeah. here. So, um, something that we kind of refer back to from time to time in these episodes is the idea of like if you're having trouble with engagement, even like 30 days out, the first place to look is potentially back at day one, day two, your onboarding process, the first things that happen in your relationship with your client, because that's actually where you can make so much progress with long-term engagement is just setting the foundation so perfectly, right? I think we're saying day one is, when in doubt, look at day one. When in doubt, look at day one. Exactly right. There's something you could do to just make that first impression that much better, set expectations that much better, set yourself up for successful engagement that much better day one. Um, And we sort of relearned that lesson in our own onboarding process for the Nudge Coach platform. So so this is like Max said, something we've been looking into every day. And basically when you create a new free account at nudgecoach.com, you're walked through this process very intentionally step-by-step. 
It's like one piece at a time, step by step, guiding you through kind of on guardrails, a process that we want you to get through so that you have a good sense of the basics of our system. And there are several steps. So we're basically measuring who gets all the way through that process so that we can address any kinks in the hose, as it were. And we had certainly had one of those on mm -hmm. step four-ish of yeah. our process. Um, and we've been kind of agonizing over it for the last six weeks. <laughs> agonizing is, is maybe an understatement. I, yeah. I think we've had half a dozen meetings. We redesigned the onboarding process, I believe, more than once. Mm -hmm. And had half a dozen people involved in this process and thought we knew what was going on, thought we had a thought and, and we're actually planning for a, a much larger, more significant change. And this goes to another kind of complimentary detail to always rope into here. Don't try to fix too much at once. Yeah. One thing at a time. If you, if you, if you have a hypothesis that there's a problem with your day one experience, don't overhaul it change one thing and then measure it for another couple of weeks and see how things change or however long you need to get enough data points. If you're, you know, if you have a lot of clients and you have a growing business and you've got numbers are large enough, you may not need as much time versus if you don't have, have as many, but so a lot of people involved all to say, we, we thought we knew what was going on last week. What happened is I got this email from a new white label partner of ours who was going in and trying to kind of start building some experiences. And this person asked me a really interesting question through email and I was perplexed by it and I couldn't figure out what was going on. So I said, well, hey, let's hop on a quick Zoom because I'm, I'm just baffled on what you're talking about. And I didn't realize she was building all of this still in our onboarding process. I thought she had kind of gotten through onboarding and was building cards in the card builder and all this good stuff. And it was interesting, always, always, always watch someone go through your experience, whether it's your onboarding experience, your new, new client experience, your sales, you know, watch somebody actually click around, share screens, let them click around and just watch it. It's, it's the most fascinating thing. <laughs> so we get on a Zoom, she turns on her screen. That's when I notice, oh, she's in the onboarding sequence still. Okay, gotcha. So to Phil's point, it's on rails. We walk them through step by step. So interestingly enough, she created her initial card, which we walk them through. And then she's on the screen afterwards where it's kind of showing you the preview of what it looks like. And we're kind of sitting there. And it was one of those things that I asked her like, okay, well, just, you know, keep, keep kind of moving ahead and we're going to get through this and, and didn't think much of it. And that's when I just kind of watched as a second, her, her kind of cursor move around a little bit. And I could tell like she, she didn't know what to do next. And it uncovered a really big problem that people didn't know how to get through this one screen in the onboarding process. It, it wasn't well marked. It wasn't obvious what the next step was. And as smart as people are, it's one of those things where, you know, sometimes the interface isn't as intuitive as you think it is. And so that's where I say, always, always, always have someone walk through your experience and just watch how they interact with it. We had, like I said, half a dozen meetings over the past two months, half a dozen team members. We had several different ideas and thoughts for how we were going to overhaul the entire onboarding flow. It ultimately came to making this one change of, hey, make it more obvious. There's a button here that you can move to the next step of the process. And I don't know if we want to touch on the numbers a little bit because it's pretty phenomenal, but we, yeah, I don't have them in front of me, but let's just to th so say we're losing, you know, something like 25, 30 percent of people at that step, something really. Oh, I, I have a rough numbers. The okay. we had we went from having about 50 to 60 percent of people getting through it, our onboarding flow, which this yeah. is this is like super transparent. This is us like, here you go, transparent <laughs> to the audience, which was interesting because we have a lot of people upgrade into paid plans. So the people that were getting through it, were getting through it yeah, and having very a well educated, well educated. Yeah, exactly yeah. what to do. So we were hoping and making this change once we kind of figured this out over the past week, Oh man, like that'd be really cool if this unlocks like an additional, you know, 10 to 20%, which would be massive. I mean, that's a huge jump from kind of um, making one little change, not a ton of data yet, not a ton of data yet, 
but so far when I looked at this yesterday, it was at closer to 85%. So you're talking about almost a 50% or so in, in increase from where we were, yeah. which is phenomenal. I mean, yeah. yeah. So imagine, change. all right. Yeah. 25 to 35% or more of your clients stick around for like a next agreement or a follow-up plan yeah. or six extra months, you know, you're setting yourself up for that. Like, when we talk about the number one rule of an online coaching relationship, remote coaching is engagement, like the number one goal. If you don't have someone engaged, you have no chance of changing their life for the better. If we can't get someone through an onboarding pro process in our software, we have no chance of helping them, you know, improve their business, use our platform successfully, um, manage their clients more effectively, efficiently. All that good stuff that we're, you know, dreaming about, obsessing over, you know, how to deliver the perfect coaching program uh, through an app. We can do that until our face turns blue. But if we don't have people engaged up to the point that they start building, there's no point, right? Yep. So it's just, you know, narrowing down into these first principles and understanding where, where things can go sideways, especially early in the process. Like you can't spend too much time mm -hmm. there. <laughs> and there's a really important, and we've probably mentioned this, I think it's been months ago, there's an important um, concept in the kind of SaaS software world that we're in. And I think it's relevant for, for every kind of business this day and age, because we're all doing online stuff, is the idea of time to value. So yeah. when a person signs up, how quickly are they seeing value and how quickly are they getting that aha moment? So you know, we're, we were just talking about kind of a free offering. Same concept applies for anything else. If you're onboarding someone into a paid plan, whether it's a, your one-to-one -one or maybe it's your more scalable uh, kind of pro programmatic offering, the same thing really applies. And just make sure you think about, in, in to your point, it may be just like one little piece that's that's tripping someone up or it, not properly setting expectations or there's some confusion or maybe there's just a wording, something with your wording that yeah. makes it feel like it's not really appropriate for them. Like they're not a right fit for your offering. Mm -hmm. So really look at that kind of like obsess over the day one experience. Like, you know, I don't think we can stress that enough because of the example we just walked through. I mean, a change like that can have just incredible implications for your business long-term. Yeah. It's hard to communicate this in an audio only medium. Yeah. Um, I'm waving my arms and getting really the, excited. Uh, the change is very small. <laughs> we made like visually yeah. um so if you looked at the two screens you'd be like that's not that big of a deal <laughs> Maybe. well so yeah here's here's another lesson that i you you probably have, have mentioned before to people is users don't read that's like the mantra we live by internally yep. and i think it's that example for us was that hey we we had something that was too wordy we went to big button and seem to get people through the process. So I would say just be very cautious. I, it was funny. Someone actually had me testing their onboarding flow. And that was actually one of the big things I see. It, I think people are very quick to try to explain everything. Mm -hmm. And a lot of text, maybe it's in on the pages people are going through in a process, or maybe it's their sign up confirmation or welcome emails. Simplify, simplify, simplify. Colors, buttons, make, yeah. make it easy. People don't read. I mean... <laughs> Yeah, it's so true. And trust me, I kind of hate saying that I wrote the copy for a lot of the stuff that we're talking about. You know, I, I think words have incredible value, but when people are just getting into like a software, just learning about something, mm -hmm. your eyes don't grab every single word. They just don't on a website. If you're popping around a website, popping around a, you know, a software platform, looking for different things. Um, so you know, you got to be humble about it and just try to solve the problems in every way you can. And most of the time it is going to be simplifying and, and, um, drawing attention to the right places. There's a reason that, um, I think design kind of the design styles have gone in a certain direction, which is like a lot of white space sparseness. Um, and that's because, in a white background, you can draw attention to one specific item a lot easier than if there's a lot of chaos and color going on all over, all over the place. This is just all tied to the same lesson, which is 
there's going to be one important thing that you need that client to do when they're just kind of getting started. Make sure that is the most obvious thing that they're going to see there. Right. Yeah. Um, Cause you I can't expect them to, to like, to absorb everything and to like do multiple things at once, basically process multiple things at once. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause I, I guess, you know, anyone who's in online coaching knows you're wearing multiple hats. You didn't, you didn't realize as you were probably getting trained to be a coach that you also had to be like a digital marketing expert. You had to have some web knowledge. You had to, you know, create email campaigns, all that kind of fun jazz. I would now say a new hat you have to wear <laughs> is you have to also be a UX expert. So just add it to the list. You're now a UX expert. You have to analyze everything, the user experience. You know and why I'm, that is Mac? Why is that? It's because 2021 is the year of the client experience. <laughs> the year of the client experience, <laughs> which I feel like someone did mention that to me on a, one of the calls. Somebody listens to the podcast and I just, I completely geeked out over it. Um, <laughs> but it's, I think it's so true though. I think now, and you're seeing some really neat experiences. I mean, you're seeing, I can think the, some of the calls I've been on were kind of seeing coaches websites and then seeing how they're handling the, the enrollment process. They're starting to think through that onboarding into some of their, um, well, I, let me put it this way. I think there's a lot of emphasis going to the, the kind of the sales and marketing side of things. Mm -hmm. I still think there's room for improvement on that day one experience of kind of onboarding. I still think some people are maybe cutting some corners, not fully giving onboarding the time it really needs. And I think that's what's leading to some of the perceptions of, you know, maybe online coaching, they're struggling with that. They're having a tough time with engagement. I think it all comes back to that day one experience. Like you, you can't guide a person enough on day one. I, I, I don't think I can stress that enough. Yeah. A new client is like a new baby. Like mm -hmm. you obsess over everything that baby does. They don't know how to do much yet. You have to spoon, literally spoon feed everything. Mm -hmm. bottle feed them if you want if you prefer that terminology yeah. you're going to obsess over that new baby and kind of groom them and groom them and groom them onboard them into the world so that they can have success right so it's kind of a microcosm of that i mean no one knows all that you know this is an important lesson to relearn every day too like i have mm -hmm. to relearn this every day no one knows all the stuff that you know about your business your expertise all that stuff so when you think about communicating the value you're providing, you really have to take it down several notches and speak simply, guide mm -hmm. them, spoon feed them. It has to be simpler than you think it has to be. It's almost always the rule. Absolutely. I mean, I, I still think it's, it's funny. I think about conversations I've had over the past few weeks. I'm still seeing a lot of people that are, you know, handling onboarding in a pretty passive way, which I, I think, you know, you always expose yourself to risk. So if, if you were just kind of having your initial session with a client and then just kind of sending them some things afterwards, I think you're setting yourself up for potential frustration. And that's where like, I can't, you know, it, I always go back to the whole idea of when you were in school, the teacher didn't just throw a book on your desk and say, good luck. You know, it was, Hey, this is the book we're using here that, you know, here, here's the pretty cover. Here's the name of it. Here's the chapters here. You know, this is what, how we're going to use it. And I really think anything you introduce in the coaching experience, especially on day one, should be should really be broken down that way. And I I think platforms and technologies fall into that as well. I think anyone who's using our platform, I would completely stress, hey, you know, give it 10 to 15 minutes during your initial session to handle onboarding properly, where you can make sure you get the app on their phone. You walk them through how you want them using it, making sure they get connected to your account okay to make sure it's broken into those chapters and those exercises, much like that textbook. It's not something that they're just kind of willy nilly using out there in the world. Um, so just me on my soapbox. There you go. Soapbox it up, man. That's why we're here. Um, this is the soapbox. This is, this is the, the digital soapbox. soapbox. That was a, that was probably a contender for the, was that a rant? Other, could have been name a rant. Of this podcast could have been, you know, the soapbox, nudge coach soapbox. There you go. That might be the next podcast we launch, by the way, when we have a media empire. I think which... that is that is a good name for a podcast. I feel like the soapbox. Nobody take that. I think we're gonna run with that somewhere. Yeah. All right. Coming soon. Nudge Coach Soapbox with at least Mac underscore Gamble. <laughs> <laughs> this sounds so cryptic. Uh, no one will have any idea what that's gonna be about, but it'll it'll be good. It'll be good. I know it's gonna be good. That's all I know. Yeah. Um. 
So going along with measurement, I mean, the interesting thing about this conversation is that I would say a lot of coaches actually end up at using the nudge coach platform with an idea of their mind of like, I want to measure more of what my clients are doing. I mean, that's one of the kind of the core value propositions, which is interesting. I, like you said, I don't think it always trickles back though in their business to, you know, okay, in our actual Mm -hmm. onboarding and internal workflows and all the steps that get us to that client, are we measuring every single step diligently Mm -hmm. so that we can improve those things? Why do you have your client tracking things and measuring things so that you can identify when there's a problem Mm -hmm. so that you can see improvement over time so that you can justify what they're spending with you to show what the outcomes are like all of those good things. There are a lot of reasons why we measure. Um, and I would just say, take those back a couple of steps and apply them to the whole process, the whole client journey. I think a lot of the coaches, cause I think you're, you're onto something. I think the ones we probably encounter are ones that are taking a more kind of quantitative approach to coaching. So I, I think there's a, and we may even be a little bit skewed in our view of kind of the industry in that way, because we may just be more naturally attracting those people versus still, I'm sure there's probably still a lot of coaches out there that are like completely content with pen and paper and journals and yeah, power to you, do what works for you. But um, it does make me wonder too, though. I, I do feel like, as we're talking about metrics and measurement, I think a lot of the lens they're looking through is still very much metrics from a standpoint of one individual client, not kind of zoomed out from, okay, here's my pool of clients and kind of more um, kind of, I don't know if macro trends is maybe a better way to put it, where we're thinking about how that pool of people has flown through kind of the sales and the marketing process and the onboarding, so on and so forth, kind of across stages. And that's where I think there's room for improvement in the coaching world. Um, But I mean, I, I do think it starts by really thinking about a strategy around kind of the metrics for how you work with a client, because then you can think about how that maybe how you can zoom out and kind of use that across the board, but it's good. It's pretty good. Um, Observations, just observations. Yep. These are, I think these are good ones to take to heart. Mm -hmm. By the way, if people are using pen and paper, do you still use that, uh, that journal you used to use? Oh, the rocket book. Yeah. 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 So I use, yeah. So shame. I mean, I, I use, I, it's funny. I always go back to best self. So if anyone's not familiar with it, I'm a big yeah. fan of it. A couple of years ago, I started, I felt like my days were just hectic for the sake of being hectic and I wasn't actually getting anything done. So best self kind of combines kind of daily planning, you know, map, you know, each day you basically map out your hours and you map out kind of what your goals are today's targets. So the whole idea is even if you're busy, at least write down like several things you're going to get done today. <laughs> yeah. And I think it, it really helps. And there's other pieces of it. I mean, it, if you really want to get into it, it's like weekly and quarterly planning and stuff. And it's like, you know, good, it's good stuff around like KPIs and OKR tracking and stuff like that. But um, rocket book was the one I was using for a while, which love the concept of it because I'm a lefty. This is like getting down in the weeds about me in general, because I'm a lefty my hand smears their ink that they use. So it's like not a left-handed friendly journal because it's kind of like a, you could basically erase the pages with this cloth so you could reuse it. Super cool. But I being a lefty, it was, it's a tough world I live in. It is. So if, if no one is familiar with this issue, this really just devastating issue that society is facing left-handed people in society, for example, whiteboards are just not meant for, for left-handed no. people. <laughs> it's really funny watching me write on a whiteboard because I, I look like I have like a wrist issue and I'm standing awkwardly right in front of the whiteboard. Yeah, it's it's a tough world, man. Tough world. Yeah. But Rocketbook is cool. The coolest part about Rocketbook, remember, I got those magnets you can throw on a whiteboard yes. that you can, they, with the app, you can take a picture of the whiteboard, anything you've written on it. And it digitizes it into like a nice, pretty PDF. If anyone has tried taking a picture of a whiteboard, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You get a glare. It looks funny. It looks terrible. Mm-hmm. This actually makes it a really nice, pretty PDF that you've got on your phone that you can then email yourself. Yeah, that was always one of the coolest things, even if it was like a bit gimmicky. But like you put the little tabs up in each corner. This is the useful time to be watching on YouTube, by the way, everybody. I'm pointing to the corners of the screen. Put one on each corner that like yep. serves as the frame for the photo you take, and that's able to transition into a PDF really cleanly. Pretty what cool, I, Rocket Book. I'm gonna what I love link. about it though is the 
we've all seen these projectors before. That was like, so, I love when someone solves a really complicated problem with like really low tech technology, yeah, low cost, because we've all seen those whiteboards out there that have like a projector mounted to them and they cost, I think like five grand. Yeah. And then you see a company like this say, well, hey, we're just going to solve it with software and build like these little, you know, sell these little magnets for 20 bucks, and then you use their app and it handles the scan and it looks it looks great. So you don't have to have a $5,000 projector whiteboard combo. So that was definitely the best part. I love a good software solution to a really complicated problem that people are trying to build hardware to solve. Yeah. Pretty, pretty funny. So I have no idea why we got talking about journals, but we're here I now. I couldn't help it. I, that's exactly what I was hoping you would get into, but okay. Well, you know what? I'm going to, cause some people are pen and paper people and they may even be listening to us. Um, even if you don't use it with your clients, you know, you can use it in your day to day. Uh, so best self rocket journal, a couple of things you can check out. I'll throw some links in the uh, show notes for that. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> oh, who hears the fire truck going by me? I wonder if that's getting picked up in the background. Oh, I, I heard it definitely got picked up. There we go. What was, what was next on the agenda? Next on the agenda was, can you think of any other reasons we're measuring? Yeah. So I guess in general for any, anyone that, so we measure just to kind of give, I'm not going to go in individual data points, but basically our sales and marketing kind of the, the snapshot we take each week for the most part is, um, so it's kind of our full funnel. So thinking about top of funnel activities like site traffic and new free accounts that come in, the new conversions that come in, so the number of new customers we get, and then the amount of churn that we have. So if, yeah. if, you, if you're a coach with only you know, a handful or a dozen clients, tracking some of that granularly each week, probably going to be an overkill because you don't necessarily have a lot of new customers coming in and coming out week to week. Um, However, if you're someone who's really expanded, maybe you're dealing with kind of a high, a high volume offering, it's something you may want to start looking at that, especially when it comes to churn. And I can't, I can't say enough. When you start launching a lower cost offering, membership-based offering, something where people are paying you probably un, under $100 a month, uh, you really do want to be thinking about churn and what your churn is each month and really be thinking about ways to optimize that. So for us, you know, it's, it's like site traffic, number of free accounts, we do number of calls too, but um, number of new customers coming in and then churned accounts. So the main ones we're kind of looking at from like just week to week, hey, is everything working okay? We then, to Phil's point, we do a lot of analysis around like the conversion rate, or excuse me, on the completion rate of our onboarding flow, because for us, it is so important. Um, you know, if these people aren't getting through our onboarding flow, means they're probably not going to book calls with us and they're probably not going to have a great experience. So um I think in terms of if you're just getting started as a coach or you have a small business, I look at site traffic. I look at the lead you have coming in, some good starting points there. You can start looking at kind of what that conversion rate is from site traffic to becoming a lead. You know, and maybe you're using something like MailChimp for your emails. That's what we use. Um, I don't know, Phil, any other kind of metrics you want to touch on that you think are important? Yeah, I think those conversion rates, sorry, what were you going to say there? I was saying just for this conversation, I I know there are a lot of important metrics out there just for this conversation. Yeah, I'll try not to get too crazy. But um, no, I I, I think that's absolutely, you know, where you start is kind of unique visitors to the website or however you're you're kind of getting people. You know, this Mm -hmm. this could... There, we definitely have clients where this would go into a conversation about how many people are coming from my Instagram account, how many people are coming from whatever else, right? And the majority mm-hmm. are literally from Instagram. Um, but either way, you get kind of unique visitors to the website, leads. You want to know that conversion rate because that's mm-hmm. where you're going to really start to see kind of the effectiveness. If the conversion rate is, say, 3%, mm-hmm. you know now you have that benchmark, it's 3%. If you make any changes to your landing page now, your web page, you know in a couple of weeks time, depending on your volume, if those changes are positive for the experience to convert more leads or if they're negative, if they're hurting your, um, your uh, workflow there, your funnel. So that's it. You just measure to find those opportunities. And like I said, it's not always immediate. We've been measuring literally every thing, every page, every screen that a new client of ours touches on the way to creating a free account and setting it up. And we identified weeks and weeks ago that there was a, a pretty big drop off on this particular step. One particular page of this, you know, if you go back to the kind of the first page visit, that could be 
like 30 things that are happening, but um, this one particular page and we knocked out one thing, which I'm going to go ahead and say, this is the most nuanced thing ever. But Mm -hmm. if you hit the back arrow, it just kicked you out on a, on the browser. This is what you don't think about when you're designing something. But if you hit the back arrow on the browser, it kicked you straight out of uh, the onboarding experience and and you never got back in. So we, we fixed that so that we were absolutely tracking everyone on rails through every step of this onboarding process. So when you hit the back arrow, you come back in, you're at the same step of onboarding, but we still had the same issue. We still had the same drop off at the same point. So that's an example of you can control for more things, but not solve the problem, even if you know where the problem is. Um, and you know, next thing we know, Mac gets to see someone just run into this step and be confused. And we've got a solution, which is just a, a slightly more obvious button. Funny how it works, but the, I'd, I'd say too, if you're someone who's maybe new to this, or even, even if it's, you you've got some experience, to, as Phil mentioned, you know, everything gets measured. Like, you know, Google Analytics means we can measure everything across our website. We have, I think, amplitude we use across a lot of kind of within the app itself and within the platform. That doesn't mean you have to try to fix everything all at once. And I'd say, like, really don't get overwhelmed by this. It's great to track everything. Don't try to fix everything all at once. Don't let it overwhelm you. It's take it one kind of one week at a time. Try to optimize one metric at a time. And, you know, we've been, we've been doing this for, for years at this point, you know, I think we've been working on our funnel for over five years and it's something that, you know, changed significantly with the transition to the freemium model, but it's just something where start with one metric, improve it, then move on to the next one and, and prioritize them, see which ones are really causing you the most issue. Cause top of funnel is always going to be the largest numbers and the largest change. Cause if you've got, you know, thousand or 2000 or whatever it is, thousands of people going to your website, and hardly anyone's going to the next step of your funnel, whether it's, you know, booking a call with you or joining your email list, that's maybe a good place to start is just kind of getting help and get that number up a little bit. And then you can kind of take that next one. Well, how, how can we get more people to, to book calls or how can we get more people to say yes on the sales call or whatever it may be? So don't, Mm -hmm. don't think you have to, just because you're measuring, it doesn't mean you have to fix it today. Very good point. Don't let it overwhelm you. Um, Every number you're measuring is an opportunity for improvement, right? Because you'll know if you're mm-hmm. if you're getting better once you start measuring it. So, um, and I would even potentially like I, you know the biggest numbers are at the top of the funnel. But based on just our experience and in our business, I would potentially argue like start at day zero of client becoming a client mm-hmm. and work outwards from there in any direction you need to, where you're spending most yeah. of your time like just because it, that person is that that conversion, like it's hard to get, it's expensive. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort. It's like your little baby chick and you don't want to crush it. Make sure that that is as optimized as possible because you want to make sure that like you've worked hard for that every time that that's as good of experience as possible. And you can kind of build back up. So that yeah, keep them around more efficient, um, at every, every stage of the funnel moving back up from there. Um, and then, you know, once you're getting enough clients, which is never the case, right? Mm-hmm. You never have enough clients. <laughs> um, you can start moving through kind of the course of your program to op- optimize that more too. Well, put put bluntly, um, you know, if customers are signing up and they're not sticking around, not worth putting emphasis on signing up more customers. You got to fix that hole in the bucket first. That's right. Um, that gets into a new metric, customer lifetime value. Lifetime value. Lifetime value. Um We'll save that one for next time because we've been going for a while. <laughs> yeah. I think this is good though. Hopefully, you know, hopefully if you're listening to this, one of the three listeners we have, you've got ideas, questions, motivations, inspirations. Let us know what you're focused on, what you're what you're measuring. I think you know, every every business is different, every funnel is different. So interesting to see kind of what what are the key performance indicators you're kind of living by with your coaching business. For sure. I got some good emails after last week, by the way. So appreciate everybody. Jill, Dr. Feely, a couple more. Um, Shout out to Dr. Feely for the audio message, by the way. Audio I, message after our uh, our episode on the value of audio and the, the content, I definitely appreciate audio content that. boom. That was very yeah. good. Um, very cool. So keep that up, guys. Uh, you can send us straight into phil at nudgecoach.com. I've stopped, stopped giving out the podcast email address because why not? You guys want to connect with me anyway, right? Not, not the underscore. <laughs> you can also send me a message on Instagram at, at the underscore. 
That's you. Max that's not my underscore. Form. It's just Gamble. Mac underscore Gamble. It's not like the the underscore just sounds ridiculous. That's not what my name is on Instagram. <laughs> Wait, can we please make that your name? The <laughs> underscore. <laughs> I can see if that's available. I guess we can see if I could change to the underscore. It seems if it's like <laughs> somehow you you have started a movement where people are calling me underscore now, and I have no idea how you did it. If uh, uh, I hope I get an email from someone who has just the underscore on Instagram. He's like, guys, what the hell? Uh, <laughs> I guess if I was going to do this, would it be the underscore, then, then the word underscore? Like, how would you actually... I, that's that sounds like a, a clever setup to me underscore some, the underscore <laughs> some people have these yeah it's kind of amazing there's uh someone took some ideas from us so yeah. all right we'll we'll take our cut of that whenever you got a chance that's 10 percent um all right guys so another thing you reach out to us for if you're using the nudge coach platform and you heard about us first on the podcast we have a random discount generator I can't believe you actually for put you. this together. So you I, actually have a random discount generator. We joked about it last week. And it turns out there's a website. That you, I, all I did was Google search like spinning wheel or something like yeah. that. And there's like a random website. It's like an open source tool where you can just type in a bunch of fields and it generates a spinny wheel for you. No joke. So I'll just record myself spinning that wheel for you and you'll get somewhere between having to pay 5% extra for your account to, uh, uh, you know, 20% discount. <laughs> that is a really funny, that that's kudos to ever put that together. That's pretty cool. But hey, it, we appreciate it, life you all isn't, listening. Though. Life is less fun without risk. So just know that there is a pay an extra 5% on the spinny wheel when you go into this. Wait, are you serious about that? God, pay five living, extra percent to living play on the game. edge that is living on the edge <laughs> but you can you can save how much 20 percent. oh man that's right yeah one option is phil's choice also so technically i could give you whatever i want but um <laughs> you know you also never know how that's gonna go that could be even worse than the pay extra five percent yeah who, who knows? knows depends on who <laughs> you're in, right well that's cool so we definitely appreciate everyone listening um, you know, ultimately want to give anyone a discount for, for listening. And we do appreciate the email. So just let us know. All right. We'll see you again next time, guys.